Yes, uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, very much happy to see so many people waiting for the last lecture, last presentation here. Um, as said, my name is Dan Sukino Kamenko. I'm a PhD student at the University of Gothenburg, and I'm very proud to put this logo on the first of my uh, presentations in the international um, environment. So uh, please do not judge me too harshly. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, today I'm going to talk about crossing disciplinary borders in a particular topic, namely, my presentation is a heavily condensed draft of two chapters from my future PhD thesis, which bears a preliminary title, Viking Age Things in Scandinavia and England, a Comparative Study. Namely, I'll try to introduce the tangled methodological and historiographical challenges that my research entails. I'm well aware of the time constraints, but the more I've been trying to dissect them, the more it occurred to me that they need to be assessed together. In the core of my presentation today is the staggering dichotomy in the examination of the Thanes in the Viking Age North. On the one hand, professional historians prefer to first stay within their narrow specialities, for example, runology or Anglo-Saxon studies, and second, to neglect the development of source criticism. On the other hand, whenever the disciplinary borders are indeed crossed, it is the non-specialists who do so, and thus their generalizations are highly debatable, not to say speculative. When I was presenting my project to my Swedish fellow PhD colleagues in uh, Lund three months ago, I deliberately avoided giving a solid definition of what or who a thing was. The reason being exactly that. The definitions established in historiography are either somewhat negligent in their source work or lack a commonly accepted consensus in the first place. Yet a point of departure must be set, so I'll cautiously suggest that things in the both regions constituted a social upper stratum, probably somehow related to the ruling king's achievements, but any statement beyond this must be meticulously contextualized. So here you can see supposedly a 8th century, yeah, 8th century Northumbrian king with a warrior standing behind him. Right. I shall start my survey of the English historiography with the first volume of the Constitutional History of England by William Stubbs. Though it first saw light back in 1874, its narrative has deeply penetrated the national historical myth in Britain. The word Thane appears a minimum of 160 times in that book, and in a nutshell, Stubbs' description is as follows. Thanes used to be warrior members of the Royal Comitatus, but by about, about 930s, this group splits. Some absorbed the upper crust of the free population, while others consume the former aristocracy by blood and become the new vassal nobility. For a commoner to become thane-worthy, he needs to acquire five hides of land and a special appointment in the king's hold with other judicial rights. I'll briefly remind that a hide originally was a measure of land capable to provide for one family throughout the year, but by the end of the period, it, has evolved in, it had evolved into a fiscal unit. Uh, the thane, therefore, says Stubbs, is now the possessor of five hides of land and as such bound to service in war, not necessarily by his, by his relation to the king, but simply as a landowner. The idea of social mobility is of prime importance to Stubbs. There is no impassable barrier between the classes. The churl may become thane-worthy and the thane earl-worthy. Finally, he briefly mentions that a thane's war guild was 1,200 shillings. I dwelled upon Stubbs' description so long because I think this is where most of the later notions of, um, about the Anglo-Saxon thanes spawned up until now. For example, where Stubbs was content to mention thanes' 1,200 shilling war guild in just one sentence, in his 1905 Studies on Anglo-Saxon Institutions, Henry Munro Chadwick dedicated almost 40 pages proving the statement arithmetically. Ever since then, this idea has been taken for granted. In 1931, Frank Mary Stanton published the first century of English feudalism, in which he repeated and developed his predecessor's ideas. For Stanton, the differences between a thane and a churl were that, first, thanes served in the army due to their rank, whereas churls reported to the army due to their alleged old Germanic tradition, nation in arms, as Richard Abels later called it, and second, that the two classes enjoyed different war guilds. Stanton was of the opinion that those things who derived their position from the ancient comitatus were later replaced by Norman barons, whereas those country gentlemen were succeeded by feudal knights. 
Almost three decades later, Charles Warren Hollister, Hollister opposed Stanton's interpretation in his book Anglo-Saxon Military Institutions on the Eve of the Norman Conquest, claiming that in late pre-Norman England, military obligations stemmed not from one's rank, but relied up, uh, upon the so-called five height principle, which predicated military service for one man from every five heights of land, regardless of one's status. Hollister uses the word thane at least 216 times in his 170-page book, but not once does he actually explain what a thane is. Moreover, abandoning Stubbs and Stanton's views and by insisting on the universal military obligation, he inadvertently reaches a deadlock. If thanes and churls alike performed military duties on the same principle, why did the former allegedly enjoy a more advantageous social position? Uh, the whole notion of the nation in arms was later completely debunked by Richard Abels, who conclusively argued that Anglo-Saxon military institutions uh, had always been rooted in lordship and land tenure. To conclude my overview, I shall mention a 2007 book by Ann Williams, The World Before Doomsday. Unlike many, Professor Williams, uh, I'm sorry, this is the page, this is the page from, uh, this is a picture from the official page on academia. <laughs> I do not claim to have framed anyone. Um, sorry. Anyway, uh, unlike many, uh, Professor Williams dedicates the whole introductory chapter, nine pages in total, to setting the scene and establishing the position of a thane. Her study offers a stark snapshot of the British historiographical tradition in dealing with the subject. For one thing, Professor Williams would rather describe a thane than suggest a universal description. And for the other, she would recap the established views. I quote, The Wergill Terrace revealed the subdivision of the, free, of the free population into churls and thanes. Upward mobility, however, was also possible, and some churls might aspire to the rank of thanehood. In order to do so, a churl, I quote, had to possess fully five hides of his own land, on which he discharged the king's dues. Why I brought this all up is because this whole picture, painted with a rather broad brush, hinges on, frankly speaking, very loose source work. The notion of the upward mobility, this, for example, is a picture taken from YouTube. Um, so, yes, I'm not inventing it. Uh, this whole notion of a churl becoming a thane by the virtue of possessing five hides of land, essential to the Whig interpretation of Stubbs, actually stems but from one authority, Archbishop Wilson of York, who died in 1023. Wilson was a prominent figure in the government of King Ethelred the Unread and later Canute, and his literary legacy is voluminous. Such a reliable source as Wikipedia even features an article uh, which lists 21, um, sorry, 91 pieces written, edited, or revisited by the Archbishop. The passage about the churls acquiring the thanely rank appears in the text known as Yethungtho, uh, sometimes translated as Dignities, um, in, which is a fragment from Wilson's series commonly called the Compilation on Status. The problem is assessing this text. And here, unfortunately, Felix Liebermann, his first modern publisher, might have done a great disservice to the research. Liebermann put Yethungtho in his edition of the Anglo-Saxon Lords, presumably on the basis of its opening phrase, I quote, in the laws of the English, it once was that people and law were ordered by status, and the people's counselors were treated with dignity, each according to his rank, noble and layman, thane and lord, end quote. However, the style of this work betrays a rhetorical na nature, and the reference to the old law was merely an oratorical device. It has evermore been realized that, to quote Andrew Rabin, many of the practices it describes are unsupported by contemporary evidence. One might argue that a very similar passage on a churl becoming a thing can be found in an actual legal code known as Nothleo de Laha, the laws of the northern people. Um, it is true. The only problem is that it too has been edited by Wilson. Um, and thus it cannot be treated as an independent evidence. Granted, at the time of Stubbs, nothing of this was known. All the more surprising it is uh, when modern scholars do not, it seems, follow up with the development in source critique and still take those sources at face value. For example, in her book, and Williams doesn't include the bibli in the bibliographical list, a single work by Dorothy Bitharam, a prominent mid-20th century student of Wilson works. Uh, 
This, is probably, this probably explains why Professor Williams writes that ownership of five hides mentioned in Yathuntha was, I quote, qualification for thainhood which reappears in North Laodalaha. Basically, it's one and the same source. You cannot quote them separately. This rather, sim this rather simplified overview, and I do confess that for the sake of time I had to leave lots of publications out, illustrates the surprising gap between subdisciplines within the Anglo-Saxon studies alone. One can see that the Thanes have been approached from very different positions, but few historians, it appears, have actually noticed or appreciated the development of source critique achieved by their colleagues in the Old English department, which, one might argue, devaluates a great deal of the discussion. Indeed, today, upholding the described synthetical portrait of a Thane outlined above is somewhat ludicrous, uh, given the current knowledge of the provenance of the sources it stems from. Yet, it so deeply has taken root that, oh, my bad. Yet, it so deeply has taken root that finding its origin is de a demanding task. Much more often will you find such popular images as those on the screen right now. Um, one is a picture of uh, what a private West Saxon fortification could have looked like. It is completely based on Wilson's description. And another is a toy set of historical miniature available online for just 20 pounds. <laughs> and in fact, I'm totally going to buy one for myself. <laughs> Why not? Um, you can actually read. Um, I can read it for you. Uh, who were Saxon Thanes? The Thanes, pronounced Thanes, were nobles of Saxon England who held land in return for military service. And basically the same thing that Stubbs wrote almost 150 years ago. And we also learned that they're defenders of faith, somehow. Um, if we now turn to Scandinavia, the discourse has been very different but no less intricate. <coughs> Unfortunately, as you know, for the period before 1200s, we lack any vernacular indigenous written sources. The only ones available and relevant in the present context are runic inscriptions, place names, and the scaldic verse. Each of them is problematic to wield. Place names in the social studies do not speak much for themselves and require a cross-disciplinary approach, not to mention that the dating can be broader than one would wish. The nature of the scaldic verse is both its advantage and impediment. Due to its nature, it has been preserved in, it, in the original form, but one should always bear in mind that it's poetry we're dealing with. Using it to reconstruct social patterns is, well, risky. Finally, runestones do not provide much of context and are rather homotypic. Uh, in 100% cases, they employ one and the same formula. X raised a stone after Y. Y was a father or husband to X. Y was a good thing. This is a picture of one of the runestones that I was very lucky to see uh, two months ago in uh, Vestigotland. It's actually, it has been discovered rather recently in 1997. Um, right. Up until 2090, uh, 20, no, sorry, uh, 1927, Scandinavian scholars showed little interest for the word Thane in Old Norse. It used to be treated just like another entry in a dictionary. For example, in 1890, Ebbe Hedberg, analyzing medieval Norwegian laws, translated it as a free and independent practitioner of all rights of a person fully vested with liberties. As late as 1926, Fino Jonsson studied Thane's appearance on the runestones in the general context of commemorative inscriptions and rendered it uh, just as man while interpreting uh, the concurrent laudatory epithets good, very good, best, as moral characteristics. An amusing fact, this uh, particular work of Jonsson came out in the Danish newspaper Politiken. How cool is that? Uh, but everything changed a year later when uh, Danish historian Sven Okje published a breakthrough article called Old Danish Things and Drains. Uh, maybe I should pronounce it a Drans since he's a Dane, but I'll pronounce Drains and I hope you will forgive me. Uh, Okje drew attention to the frequent appearance of those two Old Nor Norse words uh, in commemorative inscriptions throughout the Old Danish Kingdom and concluded that, I quote, Though the meaning of these various expressions shows through but vaguely, they seems, uh, there seems nevertheless little reason to believe that they should only stand for man pure and simple, end quote. Instead, of, instead, he postulated that thanes and drains were members of the king's comitatus, known in Scandinavia as hirv. Given what I said about the nature of the relevant chronic inscriptions, you might ask, how could it have been done in the wanting context? 
The answer correlates directly with the name of this conference, Cross Disciplinary Approach. Occhio noticed that Old English featured words thane and drain too, the, light, the latter being, of course, a loan word from Old Norse. And he simply extended their meanings. Towards the end of his paper, Occhio briefly retold the British historiography in just one paragraph. I quote, in England, the ancient hereditary nobility is distinguished by higher Wergild and maintains its existence far down into later times. Here also, however, the nobility of court uh, comes more and more into prominence, though without altogether superseding the old nobility. Uh, thanes, in return for their services, are granted lands by the king. In course of time, they rise to, a form, uh, to form a class of attendant nobility, specifically qualified for military service, and are not only favored and honored by higher Wergel, but, um, but also by greater estates of at least five hides. Um, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, very much like in the case of Stubbs, Orkis' article said the discourse patterns that have been long followed. Not everyone has agreed with this, such interpretation. Orkis' greatest opponent on this matter was the Danish chronologist Karl Mark Nielsen, who in 1945 published an in-depth article directly challenging his predecessor already in naming his paper Va Tainere or Tränge Kongelie Hidman. To summarize his argument, Nielsen pointed out that looking at the runic material as it is alone, while not having comitatus in mind, it is impossible to render the term in question as king's retainers. To simplify, Nielsen conceded that drains could have become such, but this certainly wasn't the case by default, whereas the thanes were the backbone of the Viking Age Danish society, the well-to-do bondir. These two standpoints still hold in the Scandinavian historical narrative up until now. Basically, scholars with a thorough philological background hold fast to the Norse literary sources that do not support Orkia's claim. Such, for example, was the opinion of John Lindo expressed in his 1976 book Comitatus, Individual and Honor Studies in the North Germanic Institutional Vocabulary, in which he agreed with a much earlier work by Hans Kuhn that in the Viking period the word thane did not convey the sense of a rank, what uh, Kuhn described as Rangsbezeichnung. Today this view is supported and promoted first and foremost by Professor Julius Schesch from the University of Nottingham, and who dedicated a great deal of energy to comparing the runic inscriptions and the skaldic poetry. On the other hand, some historians saw Occhio's argument as conclusive and supported it from a theoretical perspective. Nils Lund, for one, even managed to at least partially reconcile the two opinions in his own research. Uh, I quote, one can hardly imagine that the Viking Age kings, rulers of a newly united Denmark, allowed peasant chieftains like Erle at Lavenrup to sit in various places of the country with an armed force of their own without having declared their loyalty to the king and thus having become his men. By that, they had not become members of his household, but since there had been established a personal bond between them and the king, they became, at least in theory, members of his heard, um, and that way his things. This is all great, but there are no sources to support it. This is all theory. Uh, besides, it has been pointed out that philologists generally do not take into account Swedish place names. There are about 15 Tainabu in Sweden, which can ha uh, hardly mean settlements of men or people. It simply doesn't make sense. Um, closely resembling the situation in Britain, both Occhio's opponents and supporters have disregarded his source work. As I mentioned, dealing with the word thing in England, Occhio did not conduct his own research, uh, but he relied on secondhand works, which in turn, as I've shown, heavily re relied on loose source base. But to make things worse, no one even Occhio's most dedicated opponents have noticed that a weighty chunk of his argument was invalid already in 1927. You see, to substantiate his point, Occhio had to first prove that drains were a subclass of the Anglo-Saxon thanes. In order to do so, he used information from a text known as Constitutiones de Foresta, which he interpreted as the forest law of King Canute and combined with 13th century Northumbrian charters in Frederick Maitland's retelling. The problem is that the said text has nothing to do with Canute. It was written in the 12th century by an anonymous nomic clerk who probably didn't even speak English. Um, and this has been made clear, they have been, this had been made clear by Felix Lieberman as early as 1894. But Okia never learned of this. Um, somewhat personal history, history here. 
uh, or story. Uh, three weeks before he passed away, he published another article, also in Politiken, in which he still referred to the source as if it was a valid one. So he probably just never looked at Lieberman for whatever reason. Um, to recap, the heated discussion has been revolving not around the interpretation of the sources per se, but around the retelling of an interpretation. Given Okia's seeming knowledge of the English material and the lack of such among the most, most Canadian scholars at the time, some prominent rulenologists have accepted his view, Eric Moltke and Liz Jacobson to name but a few. As late as 1976, Moltke uh, wrote that since the earliest appearance of the word Thane in runic inscription was, I quote, associated with Leith, Coast, Warband, or the like, we may reasonably assume it denoted a kind of military status. Thane is then a title of rank. Who bestowed this title? Perhaps following Anglo-Saxon precedent. Private individuals do not seem to have had Thanes, so it must have been the ruler's prerogatives to appoint Thanes and certain reigns. We thus come to the same conclusion as Sven Okia, or not far of it. Uh, again, this is all great, but this is all theory. Um, just like Liebermann, Molke's authority on this matter made us a great disservice, for this opinion has been keenly accepted by some archaeologists in their re reasoning. Thus, Klaus Ransburg wrote in his monograph from uh, 1980, Thane is an Anglo-Saxon title for a royal vassal, who, in exchange for certain basically military duties, is granted land which is inheritable. What speaks in favor of a similar position open to the Danish Danes is not the contemporary contact with England and comparable political and military conditions, but also the notions that Alle, the Gothi of Glavenburg, was the thane of a Leith, the troop of warriors. Uh, end quote. To Ransburg, this is an important point in his argument for the, estate, uh, for the state formation in Viking Age Denmark. The prominent position of king's followers in the localities speaks for the prominent position of the central authority. Um, Karl Loving, a Swedish archaeologist, took it even further. His work's main theme is that in the early 11th century, Jotland was governed and influenced not by a ruler from Uppsala, but, from the, but by the Danish king, who at the time was King Canute. Uh, roughly speaking, given... Uh, Sorry. Roughly speaking, given that Canute was also the English monarch and in England king's followers were known as Thanes, he argues that it is the meaning both in the place names and runic inscriptions in Scandinavia as well. Thus, we can count at least three intermediaries between the actual sources and Loving's own conclusions. English sources were interpreted by early British historians, who were then retold by Okia, who was then retold by Moltke, whose work was used by Loving. Um, so, what do we end up with? Um, as I stated in the very beginning, there's a very weird cross-disciplinary dichotomy at work. On the one hand, most special specialists prefer to restrain themselves in their immediate specialities. Uh, so much so, in fact, that surveying the position of the things, they overlook their source's precarious nation. Even if this pitfall gets avoided, there is still a large disconnection between the major fields of the Anglo-Saxon and Viking studies. The pictures you can see illustrate the case in point. Major reference books, such as the Wiley Blackwell Encyclopedia of Anglo-Saxon England, or Kulturhistorisk Lexikon für Nordisk Militid, seem to be completely ignorant of each other's related entries, which is rather staggering. On the other hand, scholars who have indeed endeavored to cover this glaring gap have used the available second-hand works to support their particular arguments, and, this have, uh, and thus have overlooked the greater picture again. To put it metaphorically, by examining the trees, we miss the forest. To conclude, what does it all matter? Well, I believe my particular case study can be related to by a great many researchers. This individual topic demonstrates how tangled modern historiography can be, and how seemingly long acknowledged views can uh, need thorough revision. I dare say that in, the, uh, in order to catch such Gordian knots, an aspiring scholar has first to return to the sources, second, set aside any uh, conceivably biased agendas, and third, cross the borders of the primary discipline and give other fields an equal appreciation. But to return back to the beginning, so who was a thing after all? Maybe one shouldn't take the answer to this question too seriously and accept some video games interpretations. The title of a thing is a great honor, a gift for your service. Gods will know to look the other way if you tell them who you are. 
This is probably the best description of a Thane in a nutshell I've ever seen. And with that being said, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. question it is highly re relevant because I believe and I'm not the only one to say this uh, in fact I picked up this line from Judas Jesh uh, that uh, at least in Scandinavia the study of the things has been wildly uh, hindered by the comparison with drains basically as we were speaking with Elena yesterday there is nothing to warrant such an opposition why would you study them together I know why because this is what Okia saw in English sources uh, had there been other words, maybe we were discussing not the, the things and rings, but maybe things and, I don't know, swains. And uh, there's actually a very interesting uh, map uh, drawn by Matske Larsen in a popular article from 2002, in which he showed that uh, settlement uh, names, uh, place names, which basically mean one and the same thing, uh, retainer plus a bu, settlement of retainers, uh, can be shown to be much more spread than just Tainabu. We've got Tainabu, Rinkebu, Sveinabu and Kalabu. Why, not we discuss, why aren't we discussing all of them? My point is that uh, I started as an Anglo-Saxonist and uh, I was most interested in things. Um, I can later tell, tell you why, but no, I believe um, this can contribute to a wider picture. Um, for example, it, can, it is worth comparing it with the situation in contemporary Germany, Russia, maybe uh, earlier Francia, yeah. but no, I do not intend to study other vocabulary, partly because it has been done, partly because I think it, I'm, it might set me off the track, very much like it has happened in the Scandinavian discourse for years. Um, sort of what I've seen from this is you're suggesting we almost restart the study of this term, and I'm just wondering, is, is there anything useful that is left after all this corruption of data <laughs> so you don't have to restart everything? Um, thank you, that's a good question. Yes, sure, there is, a lot of, uh, there is a lot of material that has been collected by my predecessors. And it is a known phrase that we are all midgets standing on the giant's shoulders. So no, I'm not trying to, dis to discard all of the previous research, and no, of course not. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Anne Williams' works, for example, is not just a recap of the establishing, established historiography. She also employs charters. Uh, she also looks at the what we today call commended men. Previously, we used to call them like vassals or something. So no, no, of, co of, co of course I'm not saying that it's all rubbish. But I do believe that there, there's a need for an outsider's view. I'm an outsider. I'm a Russian. I'm, I'm not tied into any of the traditions. So when I started, when I started looking at the English tradition, I thought things didn't exist in Scandinavia in the first place. And then it has been pointed out by Elena to me that um, you might want to reconsider. <laughs> 